up, mediums? Welcome to The Writer's Journey. I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is the sublime Kayleen Williams. We're two authors on a journey to learn more about writing with you, the audience, so thank you for joining us tonight. This episode's book spotlight is Great Stories Don't Write Themselves by Larry Brooks, and tonight we've got the author on the show to talk to you about how you can plot the best version of your story. So, Larry Brooks, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm the old guy at the bottom of the screen, in case anybody's <laughs> wondering. So, yeah, that's me. We had you on back in, was it September or October? It was somewhere in that time frame, yeah. It was When good. This, this book first came out, and mm-hmm. I would be back on to do like a part two. Um, so how have you been in the meantime? How's your winter been? Uh, it's been okay. You know, when you launch a book, you put on a whole different hat than the writing hat. And uh, I'm not, I haven't self, I've only self-published one book. So anymore, the promotional effort required of an author is the same, whether you publish traditionally or you're self-published, it's the same drill. So mm-hmm. some of that was just kind of not second nature to me. So uh, it's been tough, you know, but mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of fun too, because every time you hit the keyboard and hit enter, something goes out there and you hope for the best. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been an adventure. Yeah, I just went to a, a writer's conference in Colorado, um, Superstars Writer's Conference, and a lot of the authors out there are hoping to be traditionally published. Right. Um, so they're they're in the same they're in the same boat as you trying to get. Well, you you have an agent. They're looking for an agent. They're looking right. for an editor. They're trying to get published. Um, but what a lot of us are figuring out is, you know, we were hoping that the publisher would be able to market our book for us, but no, that's not actually. Oh. The- Yes. Yeah. It's it's still on us. Yeah. And that's a whole different animal. Right. It is. And the the belief that a traditional publisher will market for you is almost washed away completely. You know, they mm-hmm. they put it's an 80-20 thing, but the numbers are even worse. It's more like a 95-5 thing. They put 95% of their marketing resources to the 5% of the A-list authors that sell out fast and big leaving the other 95%, not of submitted authors, but actual published authors completely on their own to build their list, build their their community, build their website, and go out and knock on doors and appear at bookstores all on their own. Even the big five publishers aren't aren't supporting the vast majority of their their published writers. So we're all kind of in the same boat, self-published or published. We're all all competing for the same online attention as, as anybody else. So if you're hoping to get published, you've got a huge mountain to climb. First, you got to write that book. Yes. And if you're hoping to go traditionally published, you got to you know submit to an agent, get in that slush pile, right. hopefully get attention. And even then, you're not done. You want to be in that five percent right. that gets uh, put forward by the the publisher. And you bring up this topic early on in your book. Right. You gave a statistic that it was something like, and then you kind of um, changed it too, but something like 96% of manuscript submissions get rejected. Then you said, actually, it's more like 99%. Yes, it it is. All of them. Can you explain explain that statistic for us a little bit? Right. Well, the first 96 is agents accepting a manuscript for representation. 96% get get say no. Now, a lot of people were going, wait a minute. I went to a conference and I asked me to send the first 50 pages. Well, that's more like 30 to 40% of what they hear, they will read something. But they end up saying, here's your contract for representation to about 4% of those, and the 96% go on. Now, the reason that number goes up is when the agent says, yes, I will represent you, they have to start submitting it, and they don't always sell what they represent. So Mm -hmm. the percentage of rejection goes up even further. And... Then when you factor in, if it isn't just getting published, it's actually reaching a big audience, the little sliver of published books that actually earn back their advance and Mm -hmm. start a career. Now, that's all really depressing stuff. I I actually don't like talking or writing about it, but the reason I do is that it emphasizes that the qualitative bar for our storytelling is so high yeah. We need to really focus on that because there's a lot about the outcome we really have no control over. Mm-hmm. You, know, you hear all these bestsellers 
like the help, for example, was rejected 46 times. 46 agents said no to that quasi masterpiece. Wow. Uh, the guy that wrote the uh, forward to my book, Robert Dugoni, sold 5 million copies of his novels. Mm -hmm. His first novel was rejected by agents 42 times by agents. So you think the agents know all and see all. They don't. They rejected these guys all those times. So what really matters is the perseverance of the writer, the ability to take feedback and mold and revise their work and then understand where that qualitative bar is and how to reach it. Mm -hmm. and it's not an exact science at all. That's why there's people like me writing writing books and a bunch of people at conferences talking at us and everybody has opinions and theories on that. And so we all just have to listen, vet mm -hmm. it, find out what works for us, find out what resonates with us, as opposed to just saying, well, I'm just going to do it my way and I don't care what anybody else thinks. This is for me. This is my thing. I'm just going to write it and hopefully somebody will like it. And on the other hand, secretly longing for it to find an audience, find an agent, find a publisher, whatever that outcome might be. So yeah. that's why... I wrote that book the way I did because I hadn't ever seen criteria mm -hmm. find for an author. Like, oh, you're going to write a scene? Here's eight things you need to know criteria-wise about a scene. I'd never heard it put that way. So just trying to access this this high bar from a different angle. You know, and those, those numbers you mentioned, you know, first it's just like this depressing, pretty much all of us are going to be rejected number. It's like, but remember, even the greats, you know, 40, 50 times they're rejected. Yeah. Um, your own perseverance is your greatest strength. It is. You know? and, and also being able to adapt. Yes. Um, you know, even like myself, I submitted once to um, like an agent type person and they told me a contrite um, piece of, anyway, basically they said they hated it <laughs> and, or, and I should probably stop writing. Um, That's so hard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In nine, in nine very eloquent, beautiful words, they told me to stop writing. Mm -hmm. um, but I took that and I'm like, okay, why is it, why is it trite? Why, why is it, you know, rehashed material? You know, I, I dug in and I, and I defined those words for myself and I made them better. Yeah. So get into that 1%. Never stop. Right. And, you know, as long as you truly feel you're getting better each time out, it kind of allows you to put aside the fast failures, consider that input and that criticism as a gift, understand, it, apply it to our work, and now there's new hope attached. I think we, I think human beings are fueled by hope. Mm -hmm. And imagine writing a book that you knew in your heart you had no hope of ever selling. That would mm -hmm. suck. But mm -hmm. if you're getting better every time you sit down to write, it's new hope coming into the equation. And the thing you're writing is better than the last thing you did, or the draft mm -hmm. of this novel is better than the one before it because of something you've perceived, learned, applied, something finally snapped for you, the light bulb went off and you mm -hmm. get it. And that's what keeps us going. That's what keeps writers uh, in the game with all these rejections. I had six complete novels totally rejected. Nobody's ever seen them way back when I was about your age. And uh, it, was, it was really hard. And you just, yeah. you just keep going and try to learn. That's why this craft thing, I believe, is so important to the writing journey because that's the fuel that keeps your hope alive. It isn't like, my novel's great. Well, 10 people have rejected it, but it's great, so the 11th one's going to buy it. The real hope is, oh, I'm going to tweak it based on the input I got for those 10 rejections. Now somebody really might buy it because it's better than it was. Plus, yeah. rejection is always more than the book it's timing, it's the taste of the reader, it's the market trend right now, it's somebody just published a book too much like yours a month ago, so they don't want to mm -hmm. take another one on. There's all these other factors that uh, contribute to the fact that a book is quote unquote rejected. So you just got to move forward and all we have is our craft. That's all we have. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody has a magic formula on how to, how to break in or uh, succeed once you do break in. Right. Um, but early on in this book, you're, you said that what sets apart the bestsellers from the duds is story. And then kind of most of the book is you trying to unpack what you mean by that. But right. before we get into that really quickly, I had a question about the help and Robert's book. 
Um, so they, you said they were rejected, you know, over 40 times mm -hmm. and before it, an, edit, an agent picked it up and then an editor picked it up and it got edited and got published. As an indie editor, I'm really curious, how much change did those manuscripts undergo before it got published? You know, Catherine yeah. Stockett isn't returning my calls, so I don't know what she did to the help. But I just know that most writers will tell you that I listened very closely to what I was hearing mm -hmm. uh, every time, every submission. So you could say mm -hmm. that if she was rejected 46 times, she may have made 46 rounds of revision to the book. I don't know that she did, but that's mm -hmm. entirely possible. And it's an iterative process where you get one step closer to problem identification and problem solving every time you get a piece of input. Mm -hmm. So, but then you're kind of putting all your eggs in the basket of execution of the novel. And there's the factor of what is the big idea of the novel in the first place, which is often a factor in its ability to appeal to people. Because mm -hmm. a really vanilla, trite, too familiar, flat, undramatic, unemotional story idea that works for you may not work for the next person. They just don't like that story landscape. They just don't like that idea, that concept. And no matter how well written it is, that book may not sell. So we need to pay as much attention at the very beginning to where, what we envision this novel to be. What's the idea? What's the big idea? And you really need to ask yourself, what about this idea glows in the dark? What about this idea is going to make an agent leap out of their chair just at the idea stage mm. and go, holy crap, I have never seen that. I've got to read that. I've got to read that. Send it to me because the idea is on fire. Now, it's easy to say that. That's yeah. like, go out and make a million dollars. Easier said than done. And make a million dollars today. But really, it kind of boils down to that. We need to be very self-critical about our ideas. It's like getting married. It really is. You don't marry someone after the first date. And you have criteria and tastes and you you vet that thing to the point at which you go, okay, I'm going to commit my life to this. Same thing with the book. People, I've had, I've had workshops where a certain number of people in the audience didn't have a book idea. Mm -hmm. And I said, we really need to work on our ideas. And by the end of the 90-minute session, they raised their hand and said, I have my idea for my novel now. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, well, God bless you. I hope you do. I really do. But if they go home and write 300 pages on that, that idea they got by the seat of their pants in that 90-minute session, I mm -hmm. think that's too quick. I really mm -hmm. do. I think we need criteria and a high bar for the stories. I mean, can you really look at your story idea and go, this is glowing in the dark. This is going to make me a best-selling author just at the idea stage. Yeah. If, if you go, I, eh, you know, I just want to get in the gate. I'll worry about being a best-seller later. Ironically... What's going to get you published is that glow-in-the-dark idea, not the beauty of the prose that we write. Because to be honest, here's some tough love. That's a commodity. A mm. lot of the people sending in manuscripts can write the hell out of a sentence in a paragraph. They really can. So the differentiator is a story that the agent kind of goes, whoa, that's a new take on something. This kind of, this has possibilities because it's I'm kind of squirming in my chair just thinking about this right now. So, yeah. at, so a lot at the core of, you know, what makes a good story, what makes a story you can't put down, isn't necessarily, you know, that great, beautiful prose. It's what's within that prose, you know, what's yes. at the heart of the characters, what's at the heart of what those characters are going through, exactly. what's at the heart of the world around those characters. Right. You need to put just as much um, depth and attention into those things as much as, you know, making sure we're not overusing that or mm -hmm. had, you know, those, mm -hmm. those little things that you, we very easily get very fixated on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, even when we get an idea, there's mm -hmm. a bunch of work in front of us to turn the idea into a premise. Because mm -hmm. an idea and a premise are very different things. I am currently and, in that boat right now. Yeah. yeah. And, and concepts. And concept. And that, that connects with your point about glowing in the dark. Could you explain exactly. what you mean by the difference between concept and premise and right. how to use those ideas to push ourselves to find right. that glow in the dark uh, idea for our story? Right. Concept is a really nebulous, imprecise word that's very important to us because ideas are commodities and we can have ideas all day long. But when you ask yourself, what about this idea really turns it into something special? The answer is it's almost always conceptual. 
So let's take a quick example. I'm writing a love story. It's two people that live in Tampa. They live on the other side of town and they, on the, and they meet on the bus and they fall in love and they ha one of them gets a new job and how's the love gonna, gonna survive? Well, that's my idea for my novel. A love story set on a bus in Tampa. Now, is that a great idea? Uh, not yet. It's probably not. So what's a better place to set a love story? Okay, how about set a love story among staff members at the White House? How about set mm -hmm. a love story in a university where they don't allow fraternization between faculty? And you, you, go, you take the love story and inject it into a culture that is in and of itself interesting and conceptual, and then you've added something conceptual to the core idea of your love story. What if you had like a Trump staffer and then like someone from the media you uh -huh. know, they met at one of those press conferences where they're like, you know, on opposite sides, but some something about maybe they didn't know. Maybe maybe one of them didn't know who the other was somehow, you know, and they're you know, that's the audience here, together. And, and like, then they find out we're going to have this person come up and talk about this thing. And they're like, no, you no. evil, vile creature. You know, we're no. seeing that right now in reality. The president's yeah. staffer, Kellyanne Conway, Conway yeah, is married to George Conway, who hates Trump. I she know. Works for Trump, and that's a tweet war. I mean, it's how right did, out on the front stage of the public stage. How do they stay together? Nobody that, knows. That's what I was wondering. How does that marriage work when you exactly. like that and she's on the TV like that? But yeah. it works. It works. But that's a conceptual idea right there. It's true yeah. life. That's a conceptual notion. I it's dig it. You can, so, you can bring to your core dramatic idea or your core character idea that, you know, in the book, I treat, if you recall, because you've both read past this, I treat the criteria for an idea way differently than I treat the, treat the criteria for other things. For example, premise has eight criteria to it. For a great mm -hmm. premise, there's eight criteria. But for idea, there's really only one criteria. And that criteria is that when you pitch your idea as a slug line, as an elevator pitch, as a just a quick one-liner throwaway, what, what's your novel? And you tell them, mm -hmm. they go, holy crap. I've never heard anything like that. You got to send it to me when you're done. You got to write mm -hmm. that. That's the criteria that you need to apply to the to the idea that you're going to take forward and develop into a premise and then develop that into a manuscript. And it's a mm -hmm. high bar. But it's the one that's going to get you published or if you're self-publishing, it's in the one that's going to differentiate you in the marketplace where word of mouth is the is the is the fuel. It's the stuff and self-published as much as anything else. That's what's going to get people talking. It says you've never seen this before, as opposed to a commodity idea. It's just another love story. It's just another murder mystery. It's just another mm -hmm. historical whatever. What's the secret sauce? What's the conceptual gravy that is poured over this idea that fuels the premise that you haven't even written yet. Mm -hmm. so wrapping your idea in almost um, it's, I mean, cause you're not rewriting anything, you know, no. it's like everyone knows, you know, college things, political things, but you're upping the ante, you're upping the stakes, you're upping mm -hmm. potential right. tension of either your main character, main characters mm -hmm. and everything around them. So take bland and throw color on it. And you know, that that's such a personal thing because what might appeal to us as a glow in the dark idea mm -hmm. may not have a wider interpretation that matches our own feelings about it. So what happens among a lot of people at all levels is they get an idea, they're lit, all lit up by it and they sit down and they don't actually develop it. They just start writing it. Now that's a way to get there. You know, in, mm -hmm. in the process spectrum, it doesn't matter how you develop the idea. But if you if you develop the idea before it glows in the dark, you're asking that much more of the draft or the outline that comes next to make mm -hmm. the idea glow in the dark. What if it started out glowing in the dark? What if you spent some time on the story idea itself and added a bunch of meat and a bunch of radioactivity to it so that it's just irresistible? You can't wait to write it, but mm -hmm. you do wait to write it because you let that fester and just get to a point where it must be written because this is just too good not to write. Yeah. And if you look at bestsellers, they have that. Almost all of mm -hmm. them have that with the exception of an A-list writer who's already famous because that's the concept. The next Nora Roberts novel is going to be a bestseller because Nora Roberts is the concept. She's Nora Roberts. It glows in the dark already. But yeah. we don't have that. She going. bought it. She wrote it. Buy it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but we don't have that. So, 
we need to have our idea have the reader pluck that off the shelf or online be scrolling through and go, whoa, whoa, that sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. And how often does that really happen? It's rare. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Hoddle, he tongue in cheek says, concept is what prompts you to waste six months world building and never coming up with a story. Well, that could be. But you know what? When I said there's eight criteria to a premise, if you don't add story, which is part of the eight criteria, you don't have a manuscript yet. It, mm. You could have a concept and not a premise yet. Mm. So the, it, it's a sequential hand in hand, almost back and forth thing. Because if you try to write a premise for a flat idea, the, mm. the, if you understand the criteria for premise, you may realize, oh crap, my idea is flat. So you go back to the idea itself and try to add something to it so that the premise you're gonna pull from it is no longer flat. That is exactly what I was doing today. I've had this idea probably for a few months now rolling in the back of my mind, but mm -hmm. I can't see the why to certain parts and I, I can't see the ending. Right. And there are certain just driving forces that, you know, I hadn't yet really seen, but I was really excited about the initial idea. I just, mm -hmm. there are pieces that I couldn't, I couldn't write it because there weren't there. Yeah. Um, so I love that you're saying this because I actually, kind of instinctually think like that. Like right. I can't start writing unless I have at least this full conceptual idea of. Right. Yeah. You know, the viewer that just threw out that idea, definition of concept is absolutely right. Because when you get to premise, something has to happen and it's more than just story world. So story world is very often the juice that makes an idea going a historical novel. It's what chunk of history are you placing the story in? That's the concept. That's do we does the reader want to vicariously go to that time in history? That's why they're going to read the book. But what that isn't going to sustain, it isn't going to fuel all eight points of the criteria for premise. So if you if you start to understand and value the criteria for premise, and whether you're writing a draft looking for those eight or not, or outlining or just brainstorming it. That's the goal for the for the next thing. You move from idea to premise, and then premise grows into whatever you're going to do. Write a draft, write an outline, write a beat sheet, throw sticky notes up against the wall. However you do it, um, it's it's understanding retroactively what you're working with, and allowing the criteria for where you are as a standard, as a benchmark to allow you to assess if the things you've done until now are really working or not. Hmm. Uh, and, oh, yeah, I met an author recently who publishes once or twice a month. Uh -huh. The way he does it is he starts with a concept, like um, maybe a concept for John Wick would be, you know, 60 year old assassin trying to retire, gets pulled back into, into the dark world through revenge yes. for revenge. Okay, that's the concept behind John Wick, but that's not the premise, Correct. right? The premise would be different for each of those movies, for each of those books. Exactly right. So he'll start with I'll that. I'll take that for granted, by the way. A lot of people don't know that that's exactly right. I read your book very carefully to figure yeah. out <laughs> what's the difference between concept and pre premise, because I knew it was important, so yeah. Um, but thank you, you explained it very well because you used a lot of different examples. And, and then eventually I got it and I was like, oh, it's John Wick. Um, so, okay, so he gets a concept, and then from that, he gets the plot for each of those books. Yes. And as he figures out the plot, he turns it into an outline, and he uses your four-act structure to do this. And then, he flushes, he, yeah, he fleshes out the outline until he has all the beats in each of the scenes figured out. If right. there's conversations, and he thinks of conversation, he types that out. The outline, Kayleen, the outline ends up being like 10,000 words before he starts writing the draft. So he essentially has a draft before he even starts writing it. But that way he can make changes to the scenes and chapters and do all that developmental editing right. to this really fleshed out outline. And when he starts writing, he's ready to go and he gets that book done and then he gets that book published. You know, there's people that that's you thoroughly, accurately, beautifully described the story planner plotter process. But there's people listening to you right now that are starting to either fog out, get mad, or they maybe they've already turned away. They're saying, I don't write that way. I can't do that. I'm a pantser. But you know what? The pantser has to do that in a draft. 
And Kaylee, uh, Lauren, you and I had talked about that in an email in preparing for this show, is that the, the, the pantser and the planner are doing the exact same thing in terms of the goal. They're both fleshing out the whole premise and how to put flesh on those eight parts of the premise. Whether it's in a draft or an outline, the reader will never know and the reader will never care if you're a, pl a planner or a, pl or a pantser. They don't know, they don't care, they don't want to hear that. So it's what works for us. So really, pantsing isn't necessarily inferior or superior to outlining because both take you to the point you just described. I now see the whole story. I may have it in what I'm calling a first draft, but I know now because I know the story, because no story is really going to work well until you know the ending, by the way. A lot of yeah. people get that, but that's the truth. I can't, I can't really write hardly if unless i know the ending <laughs> exactly because it's all in context to something so ending is the context because you have to lay those seeds and the foreshadowing and the pacing all juxtaposed against how the ending is going to be so until we get there until we get major milestone points on the way there it doesn't matter whether you outline it use sticky notes three by five cards uh, a piece of scrivener software whatever you do or a draft you know uh, in our in our email you mentioned Stephen King. He's a pantser, so he, he wouldn't ever outline anything. What about that? And the answer is that maybe we shouldn't try to write like Stephen King until we know what Stephen King knows. And if you look at pantsers who are frustrated and never publish anything over years, but they're diehard pantsers, they may not have let in what they need to know about storytelling, whereas People like King and Dugoni, who wrote my foreword, and writers like that, they have learned these principles and criteria to the extent it is their instinct. It dumps out of their head in alignment with all of the criteria that are in, available to us to help us get to that end game. So let's say we, we accept, because I do, that the first major plot point that launches your dramatic arc has to come into the story somewhere around the 20th to 25th percentile. That's not formula, that's gravity. You do that earlier and the reader isn't invested in the character. You do it later, the reader's bored by when are you gonna get to something? So that's the sweet spot of that. Stephen King knows that. So when he's pantsing and he's got he's 80 pages in, he knows I gotta change this story right here. I can't go to page 140 and do it, of course, he can because he writes 1,200 page manuscripts. So the 20th percentile is way down the road. But he understands that four part flow. And it, they just they think that way, they write that way. And then they like to go to conference and say, you know, I don't plan anything out. I just sit down and I write. And, you know, and I, just, I just sense the story. It's just like a pilot flying an airplane without a flight plan. They're still going to get there and they're going to land safely because they know. And yeah. a lot of new writers don't know because there's a lot to know. There's a lot of principles involved in making a story work over the arc of 400 pages. Yeah, it, is, like, it isn't simple and it isn't a straight line, right? So I think the more we know, the more we know. And the, the, you know, the more informed our process is. I'm not advocating story plotting over pantsing. I'm advocating applying principle-based instinctually fueled awareness of what a story needs to do in what order and how and when to the work you're doing however you're doing it so here's I mean, here's a good example of like what you're talking about from you know another art medium mm -hmm. right so um a watercolorist yes you know they have very specific things that they they need to follow in order to create a beautiful watercolor right. you know if you lay down all of the dark colors first you are not going to get anything bright you have to lay down all your bright stuff first and kind of build it backwards because yes. if you don't build it backwards, you can't put light on top of dark in watercolor, right. you know? So that's like, you know, part of, we need to understand what the premise, the concept, the idea and how those fit together. That's like how you fit together a watercolor or that blue and red are going to make purple that yellow and orange are no wait, blue. And anyway, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I'm nervous it's now. A, it's a but, great example. It really is. Because you know, they may not be sure what the picture is yet, but they know damn well they don't start at the foreground and worry about the background later. They just know it. It's a principle. My wife's a painter. She talks about this all the time. Loves to yeah. talk. She hears me do this stuff all the time, so she understands what I'm saying. She loves to draw those comparisons. But uh, I can 
talk analogies all day with this stuff because it's a fact of life. It's a principle of success in just about any avocation. You know, like the same thing with like drawing the human body. It can be drawn 10 million ways to Sunday. Right. You know, so long as you know general muscle here and there, you're going to have the skull form and the eye, you know, so long as you understand right. what, you know, those those abstracts within mm -hmm. the lines are, I mean, you can you can make yourself some orcs, you can make yourself elves, you can yeah, Exactly right. I, in my last book I wrote about that. I don't know if you if you saw that <laughs> or not. But think of the limited number of variables we have in drawing a person or creating a person. Yeah. You know, we don't do them upside down. That doesn't work. And with the unfortunate occurrence of an anomaly, it's a body with two legs, two arms, hands at the end of the arms, a head with two eyes, a nose, a mouth, two ears, and maybe hair, maybe not. That's all we have to work with. And yet, think of the billions and billions and billions of people on the earth with only 11 variables involved and how rare it is to find two people that look almost exactly the same. Yeah. So that isn't a formula. It's basic fundamental physics and natural law that allow you to do 3 billion variations on the human form with only 11 variables. And those pink variables exist in writing. Put that algorithm rather, and that's what it comes out with, about 3, 3 billion variations on 11. Somebody out there is doing the math right now. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's exciting. That's my comeback to people say, well, you're preaching formula here. No, I'm preaching uh, physics here. I'm preaching yeah. the, the, the foundational truth of what makes a story work. And All if right, you Larry. And those, yeah, you can create so much. Right. And we'll, we'll ask what those variables are in just a moment. But first, Kayleen has a book spotlight for the week. I do indeed. And I got myself a new mouse so I can actually scroll. Scrolling. Oh, it's glorious. Y'all don't even understand. It's a beautiful, glorious thing. All right. I love scrolling. Scrolling is delicious. Yes. All right. And today, the spotlight is great stories don't write themselves by Larry Brooks. Story is the exploration of something that has gone wrong, but a lot has to go right in the storytelling to render it a success. One of the most common questions new writers ask professional writers is how the author wrote their book. What was their process for writing it? But really, the question should be about the general principles and nature of story. Does every part of a story have what it needs to keep readers turning the pages? Does every scene every conversation, every line of description push the story forward or not. In Great Stories Don't Write Themselves, Larry Brooks shares a series of detailed check checklists backed by tutorial content for every author, plotters and pantsers alive. Beginning with the broadest definition of story, the early checklists help writers to ensure that their book is based on a compelling premise then Brooks unpacks other story elements, such as hero empathy, dramatic tension, thematic richness, narrative strategy, and scene construction, each with its own checklist highlighting specific actionable items to help you write your best story. <laughs> I, 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 just said, like, I just I wrote that myself, but I didn't. My editor wrote that, so uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's a good encapsulation of what my intentions were with the book. And thank you for sharing that. Yay. And it and it really is beautifully written. Um, I was I was telling Larry right before the show a lot of you know how to books, uh, get in and learn something nonfictiony. Um, they, I, I never can get past like the first couple chapters. It's not because the subject matter isn't interesting. It's the way those prose are delivered. And Larry delivers them like a story. He is, you know, he is quite literally showing you the eight stages of writing and the premise and the concepts through the writing of telling you the concepts and all the, and all the good stuff. So it's, it's, it's good reads. It's good reading. Well, I appreciate you saying that because like everybody watching this, I slaved over every sentence in that book like we do with our books. And uh, if you appreciated the, the writing itself, you know, some people, they don't buy writing books to, to encounter great writing very much. So I, I really wanted the writing to make it accessible because mm -hmm. there's so much to, as, to use your word, Lauren, unpack here. There's six... 
the book breaks the, the book into 16 different topical focuses, areas of discussion, with lists of criteria for all 16 of them, resulting in over 70 separate criteria that are ours for the taking. It's, it's the stuff that we take years and decades to assimilate and learn, and you still have to do that. But I wanted a resource where it's all there in, in 200 pages for people to find. And it took me 30 years to get to that point of, of, of being able to assemble that. So that's, that's the notion. That's the idea. Guys, we keep on talking about the book because we, we have an eye on the time. And we know that we are 35 minutes in and we basically scratched the surface of what's in there. And this is our apology to you, the audience, that we cannot touch on, on all of this. But we're going to try our best in this episode. So, yeah. Right. What are some of those general principles of story and what's the nature of story that we need to keep in mind when we're coming up with our concept, our premise, and then writing our draft and all that stuff? Right. Y'all have hung on this long. Here's the new <laughs> Well, about the first 30% of the book is an exploration of why writers think what they think, believe what they believe, and reject what they reject. And a lot of it has to go with we're hearing what we're told is conventional wisdom out of the mouths of other writers. Mm -hmm. And that's true for me as a writer who's writing a book about writing. So we're all on our own to assimilate, process, and vet this stuff. But I tell the story in the book of a writer who sold 11 million copies of her eight novels. Have you gotten to that part yet? Eight, and she's, I won't tell your name, incredibly, I that part. <laughs> incredibly famous. She's had two movies made of her books, and Writer's Digest did a cover article on her a couple years ago. And in the interview, this author says, well, you know, every time I sit down, this just seems like a big mountain to me, and I realize I really don't know what I'm doing, and I really don't know how I'm going to get there, and I don't know how I got there last time. Oh, man. <laughs> so what do you make of that? What's the new writer think when they hear an 11 million copy selling author saying that to us? Hmm. One of the things they can take away from that, well, there really isn't anything I can learn. I just have to sit and sweat blood out of my forehead for 12 years before I get to her point. Well, sweating blood out of our foreheads, kind of endemic to what we do, and you're going to do it. But it's a question whether you do it for 12 weeks or 12 years, because there's what you're really trying to get to are these principles that this writer, I don't know, I don't know her, so I don't, I don't want to speak ill of her, but it just sounds so romantic and mysterious, doesn't it? When you say, I just don't know what I'm doing, but I sit down and somehow this happens at my keyboard and you're going to get another bestseller out of it. No, she instinctually understands certain things and she applies them to the work as she's doing it. And whether she has decided to not think about what those things are or doesn't want to tell anybody else what she understands about them, or maybe, because some writers think this, it's such a personal thing, who am I to tell someone else what's true and untrue about writing mm -hmm. a book? You've got to discover that for yourself. But nonetheless, she's proof of her own, of, of the flip side of her own statement. She very much knows how to do this. Yeah. How to, how to do what? And the answer is, there's, I think there's a handful of real core magic pills here that I've like I said, I've been doing this a long time. I've encountered other writers who have been frustrated for 25, 30 years. They haven't published a thing. They're still doing it. God love them. That's amazing to me. And they really hang in. And, and this is put out before them. And they go, how come I haven't heard this in 30 years? Well, I'm not the only person that does this. James Scott Bell writes about the same stuff I do structurally in almost the exact same words. I call it the first plot point. He calls it the doorway of no return. It's the exact same thing. And when you start listening to people like us, who I hate the word writing guru, but people who write and talk about writing and have a few books of their own, hopefully, to, to make us a little bit credible, we're saying the same thing because we're talking about a core set of principles in the same way that people who design airplanes they aren't just, they aren't coming up with a new design every time. It's the same physics. It's the same natural laws that every person designing an airplane has to understand and has to apply. Same thing with telling a novel length story. Mm. If you depart from that, it's no longer a novel. It's a memoir. It's a diary. It's an essay. It's a character sketch. It's not really a novel when you start to depart from these core things. Okay, what is those core things? The answer is something has to go wrong in your story. So you present a character in their world 
and something is about to go wrong with their world. Now, as simplistic and as obvious as that may be for everybody listening here, I bet not everybody understood it quite that succinctly. It isn't a story about your year after graduate school when you moved to Saigon to live abroad for a year and you had adventures. The end. That's a memoir. But I hear that kind of novel pitch all the time. Nothing went wrong. I had that exact pitch at a conference and I asked the girl, I said, so what went wrong in Saigon? She looked at me and says, well, nothing. It was a blast. <laughs> and I said, so you're going to write about your blast in Saigon? She said, yes. And you're, you're sure it's a novel because a novel's fiction. She says, oh, yeah, I'm going to exaggerate some things. And it's just, it's a, a writer who doesn't know what they don't know. And I think that's a really important phrase, and we need to be vulnerable to that phrase. We know certain things, and we may accept that there's things we don't know, but we don't even know what those things we don't know are yet. Mm. So we need to be sponges. We need to take all this in. And one of those things is, it isn't a story until something goes wrong. Mystery writers say, it isn't a story until a guy with a gun shows up. I mean, there's all kinds of little memes that are this, we're saying the same thing. Something has to go wrong. From there, dramatically, pace-wise, now you've all heard of three-act structure. Three-act structure is really the entry-level, simplistic, overly simplistic way to describe how a story unfolds. There's really four major context shifts in a novel. And that's the secret weapon. And you see it in every movie preview. You see it in every book jacket of a novel. You, if you know what these four are, you can see them alluded to in these movie previews. If you have a smart TV and one of the stations on your smart TV is movie previews, go watch 20 movie previews and watch this happen. The first plot point is always in every movie preview. It's a structural thing that's there because the people doing it know that's what the whole story is draped over. It's just what it hinges upon. So the first of the four contexts is the character isn't fully immersed in the dramatic inevitability of what the story has in store for them. It's coming. It's being set up. But we meet the character. We see the story world. We establish the story world. We establish the stakes. We begin to feel for this person. And then the sky falls. Or the, the curtain opens and they have a whole new opportunity or something that thrusts them down a new path. Not the same path, exactly. A new path context has shifted from setting up the story to the second quartile where the hero is responding to that moment where they have to have to react to something something happens the hero has to react to it for that second quartile of the book they're reacting and that's literally where things get worse before they get better because hmm. something's gone wrong it's going to get more wrong in that second quartile the dramatic tension is going to jack up we're going to enter we're going to meet whoever the antagonist is and then the story is going to change again right in the middle of the story. The midpoint is an as, as essential a story milestone as that first plot point was where the sky falls. New information is going to enter the story. And that character who was basically running or reacting or being a victim or whatever is going on realizes they have to change or they're not going to make, they're not going to reach the goal. They're not going to achieve what they need to achieve or even survive or save someone or save the world or whatever they need to do until they do something different. They begin to do something different and they turn from a reactive person, character contextually to a proactive character contextually. And that's what the third quartile is. They begin to fight back, confrontation. You'll see this in every story. And then the story is gonna have one more major shift and that doesn't mean there can't be other major shifts. New information is gonna come because the, the antagonist is fighting back, whether it's a storm getting worse, somebody getting sicker, the villain getting pissed off and coming at you even harder, more heinous, whatever it is. But new information twists the inevitability of a confrontation between whatever the hero is doing and needs to do and has to do and the antagonist trying to succeed in spite of that and take the hero out with some sort of finale confrontation that resolves the issue. Four different mm -hmm. contexts. It's universal. Find me a novel that doesn't do it. I don't think you can. It's a challenge. You can't. Now, it's harder to tell that in a literary novel. But guess what? The drama I'm talking about all becomes an internal drama in a literary novel. That's the difference between a literary story and a genre story. The conflict is mostly internal based and internal focused. But it's the same thing. They're going along, the story's being set up, something happens that presses their buttons and they've got all this internal angst and they have to respond to it.
But if they don't change from that response, they're just going to take them down. So in the middle of the story, they make some kind of change. They change therapists. They leave their husband. They move to Europe, whatever they need to do. And they begin to change their behavior in the world. And they're becoming proactive. But they haven't quite gotten out from under whatever this problem is. And that's what the fourth quartile is. The context is they are actually marching toward a final confrontation of some sort. And it's universal. It's gravity. It's wings on an airplane. It's goalposts on a soccer field, whatever it is. Uh, you know, it's, it's part of the, the inner structure, the nature of story. And that very thing is what so many authors either don't know or don't accept. And they think that in a 400-page novel, they can set it up for 300 pages before anything really happens. And it happens all the time. And the degree to which we don't allow gravity to help us physics, the natural order of things in story, to actually help us tell our story is a degree to which we risk failure or rejection or compromise in our stories when the guy right behind you is submitting a manuscript that does abide by all that. And again, remember the 11 variables, but there's 3 billion different people. It isn't formula. You have all the latitude in the world to be amazingly original and shocking and unexpected in what we do. But if you don't give the reader something to root for, something to care about, something to relate to, something to feel, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to lose them. It's not about something. It's about something happening. So those are real basic things. And, and the book doesn't just walk you through the structure. It also walks you through the character arc. Uh, you mentioned narrative structure. That's one of the things you need to decide and optimize. You're going you're gonna to write first person or third person. You're going to do present tense, past tense. You're going to have two narrators, three narrators, and the help, four narrators. That's narrative strategy. How are you going to package this thing, not just default to one mode of storytelling, but what's the optimal way to pull your reader into a close intimacy with the characters and what's going on? Four intimate first-person narrators is about as intimate as it gets. That's one of the reasons the help works so well, is you see the story from four different angles, from four different characters. So that's why the Hunger Games worked. It was a first-person narration. We were Katniss in the Hunger Games. We were. We went on that ride. It was terrifying. And a third-person narrative wouldn't have worked as well. So it was a good uh, narrative choice. So this, it's all these things, 16 basic areas of decision-making we need to make but the, the direction, the, the principles of what will work, I like to think of it as best practices. Mm -hmm. It's like, you go to the doctor. Don't you want your doctor to be using best practices in the medical field instead of either not caring or just doing it any way they feel like today? I'm going to try this this way today. I've never done that before. No, you want your doctor to do it with best practices. There are best practices for novelists. There are best practices within every genre of the storytelling. Because among the people watching this, I bet we're touching every genre today, from literary, mm -hmm. science fiction, to paranormal, to historical, to fantasy, to mashups of all those things. But the underlying principles really work for every genre. And it's one of those things, once you see it and you start yeah. to read books, you're, you're going to see things in the books and especially the movies you write. Because a movie is a two-hour clinic in storytelling. A book yeah. is a 12-hour clinic in storytelling. So that's why I like movies so much as a teaching vehicle, because all of this is as true. Now, there's exceptions to all this, more so in movies, by the way, um, where it, you know it's, a, it's truly a character study and there really isn't any plot of any kind and all of that stuff. But movies are made by multimillionaire producers who can do anything they want. So they, this is a little, more, uh, a little more dispersed in the movie business than it is from novelists. Now, remember, we're new novelists. Okay. We're, you don't want to risk being experimental and avant-garde and, and going way outside the box when the agent or the reader you're trying to appeal to is expecting something that's going to work the way they expect it to work, right? So we need to give them what they want and yet still do it in our voice with our passion and our take on what these issues are in the novel we're telling. I like that you approach books and movies and Netflix and whatever, uh, trying to sit, ask yourself, what makes this story work? And then how can I use it? Now, if you are part of the show, or if you're watching the show, I think we're, you know, kind of nerds together in this, that we like to figure out 
how does this work? Mm -hmm. Let's open up the trunk on this or open up the hood. Sorry, wrong part of the car. Open up the hood, figure out how it works, figure out how the pieces interact. And then how can we use this in our story too? Uh, now, last time you were here, we came up with a premise together uh, for a story. And let's say, audience, this is you. You're, you just have a premise for your story and you're trying to figure out how you're, you're going to plot it. Uh, I think, what Larry, what you're saying is that you start with the premise, start by figuring out who your character is at the be very beginning, what the conflict is and what they're, where they're going to be at the end, and then how can you push them to get there? What inner conflicts are they going to have to face and resolve in order to attack the outer conflict? Right. Now, let, to, just as an example, let's take a look at uh, the premise we came up with last, last time you are here. A couple with a marriage on the rocks takes their family on a camping trip in a last-ditch effort to find the glue that keeps them together. They must work together to stay alive after a mysterious cr creature steals their child. Right. So, so what can you say, do with that? Okay, so you we mentioned a lot of things um, a, a little bit ago about decisions an author will have to make. Right. One of them that jumps out to me now that we could answer is like narrative strategy for this. Kayleen, what do you think? Uh, what narrative strategy, like one first person perspective uh, or third person perspective? Or um, perspective I think what the, would you do? I think a multiple POV third person would be really strong for this one because you could get glimpses of what the child's going through. Um, laying clues, you could get glimpses between the mom and the dad and you know how they're fighting. Um, if you can weave in um, the God freaking words, stop leaving me uh, flashbacks. Um, that might be really cool. Um, but you know, yeah, no, I like that. You know, I, I, yeah. I like what you say. I'd flip it to first person. Imagine a, a husband and a wife getting in their head. They're on a camping trip and neither one of them are really crazy about the other right now. Neither one of them thinks this is going to work but they had to make the commitment to try. So here they are out in the woods. They'd really rather be someone else. And you find out that the wife really would rather be with one's particular someone else that the husband doesn't know about. And therein are things that could happen right there because well, this be creature yeah. attacking them from the dark of the woods may or may not be the creature you think it is. It may be something or someone that Ooh, is she's trying to kill him. using an accident in the woods to get rid of him. But that doesn't come out until the midpoint. That's exactly where that would come out. The first plot point would be something's attacking them. They have to respond. But in the midpoint, they realize that this is something different than I really thought it was. And I don't know what it is yet. So that's how you play with this, to use structure and the principles as, you know, prompts in our brainstorming to, to come up with things that, we don't necessarily accept the first choice. Kayleen, I thought your choice of three omniscient narrators I, was great. I amended it with first person and your eyes lit up. So that, maybe well, that yeah, is or I isn't a better idea. But see, that's what we do. Yeah. I instinctually go to third person. Right. Um, so that's like kind of like where I immediately go. But that just tiny little push with the first person was just like, ooh, yeah, there's all sorts of things you could yeah. do with that too. And, and fun and to write. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, getting in that. You could even throw, like, if the kid was, like, a smart 14-year-old and have her start giving her take on all this stuff and her parents, and maybe she ends up saving the day. Yeah. Know? I mean, there's all kinds of fun stuff here. And never forgetting that we have to take the reader on this ride, that, you know, it, we're in the woods and nobody's going to help us. And something's threatening us. What are we going to yeah. do? Yeah. See, you I know? like this because the idea has so much tension in it. Right. Obviously, the, the monster, the creature, whatever it is out there, there's a lot of tension and, and fear and worry to be built around that conflict. But if you don't tell the reader right off the bat why they are there on this camping trip, and the start, the reader starts to pick up on, a, on the way the characters interact with each other, right. they start to figure out something bigger is going on here, and then what is it? Right. Then they can start to put those pieces together. So there's more tension coming in from what happened before. Right. William Tyler Davis, he says, uh, monster, Mo monster gone girl. girl. I love it. And I love the gone girl comparison because there is a whole story that happens before this book picks up. 
If you haven't read Gone Girl and you want to write thrillers or horror at all, read Gone Girl. You'll love I it. I agree completely. <laughs> Nothing is what you think it is in the first yes. half of that book. Yes. And the narrative mm -hmm. strategy becomes very, very critical to that building of tension and, and revelation at that midpoint turn. And notice that that midpoint turn is square to the page number wow. in the middle of the book. No accident, because the writer knows. It's amazing. It's a really beautifully written book. And she uses that first person strategy with two POVs, right. uh, the husband and the wife. And as the right. reader, you are you are the te detective in that story, trying right. to figure out who did the murder, committed right. the murder. Hey, I wanted to mention too, speaking of Gillian Flynn, she wrote a book called Sharp Objects. And they made a, I think it was HBO, eight part serial show about it. Did you see that last year, Sharp Objects? It's brilliant. Right. It's absolutely terrifying. But it's a great example because I get this question a lot and I, I'm going to throw it out there is writers ask, I'm writing a series. So do I have to, how do I propel myself from one book to the next? And the answer there is when you look at TV, they took Gillian Flynn's novel, Sharp Objects, and they divided it into eight episodes, but it's one story. Hmm. A serial novel is like uh, Harry Potter is eight different stories tied together by one macro story. So if you're writing a, a series of novels, every novel has its own premise, but they all share the same concept. Every novel has a resolution of this book specific dramatic tension, while the macro tension gets greater and that's what you leave cliffhanger onto the next book. But you don't you don't do don't do what he did in Game of Thrones. We are not that guy. That's not going to get us published. Where you just stop and you just have to read the next book to figure out what's next. Because look at Hunger Games. Every book stops. Every book has an ending. Mm -hmm. But Katniss comes back because the whole political turmoil with the president and the capital city remains in play. And even though she survives the Hunger Games, it isn't over because she has mm -hmm. to come back and go back into the Hunger Games, which is a whole new story. All right. Now we have less than five minutes left and we collected audience questions. So we'll try to blaze through these. Rick Partlow asks, if an author doesn't stick to a three-act structure, does that mean the book will be poorly paced in the eyes of the average reader? Well, I hate absolutes, but the answer is yes, because it means your setup is too long or too short. It means you might have skipped one of those three parts. And actually, as I said, it isn't three parts, it's four. It's four different contexts. Even when you look at three-act structure, they tell you, oh, by the way, act two is divided into two parts. Right in the middle is a midpoint. And the context is different in the first part of that from the second part of that. So it's really four distinct parts. And if you deprive the reader of that contextual evolution, the story may not be as lucid, it may not be as dramatic, it may not be as emotionally resonant. So it's a risky thing to do. Now, other than the midpoint being a pretty hard and firm thing, the other two major milestones, the first plot point and the second plot point at about the 75th percentile, they're malleable. You can move those around to some extent. But the midpoint is very important because the whole story changes and you need to change. You need to give the reader something new to, to observe, to feel, to root for. So that's where the structure helps us. And I really think that departing from three-act structure as a context flow mm -hmm. rather than as a plotting device is very risky. That's my opinion. All right. William Tyler Davis asks, how important is the midpoint shift? where the main character goes from the back foot into attack mode in a genre novel. I think it's critically important. I think it's the whole thing hinges on that. In fact, James Scott Bell, who I've mentioned, says you write your novel from the middle backwards and forwards. That's how important it is. Because unless the hero, if you never have your hero under pressure, running, worried, under attack, we don't have the empathy and we don't feel that dramatic tension. But if that's all there is, then we don't have a sense of, okay, now we're gonna now we're gonna resolve this, which brings its own form of pressure and tension that's different. And that's what the midpoint does. The midpoint is the injection of new information into the story that changes the hero's journey. It has them, and he I love the way he put that. They're on their back foot, they're they're reeling, they're kind of a victim, or they're a little clueless, or they're terrified, whatever it is, but that new information or whatever that twist is not only emboldens them, it may force them to do something different because if they keep doing the things they were doing, they're going to die or they're going to fail. So they absolutely have to 
go to their front foot and get a little more proactive and attack the problem in a different way. Now, the bad guy, the antagonist, is going to up their game too in part three. And that's the fun because the dramatic tension just gets faster and more intense and more dangerous or more emotional or more urgent in part three. And that's, that's what you want to do. You want to quicken the pace, escalate the dramatic tension, the pressure, and the stakes in part three. Helene, you want to get the next couple? <clears throat> All right. Christina Johnson asks, what happens when you're writing the story according to the plot, but it diverges? Keep with the original or go with the flow? Well, that's a great question. It's what pantsers say plotters are doing wrong. But the fact is, new ideas, well, if the more you know about the story, the more you want to welcome a new idea because you've accepted the story you were writing as working and suddenly a new idea comes, it better be better or you need to trash the new idea. If it's not better, then the new idea isn't worthy. If the new idea improves the story, I would say, kind of based on experience, that because you have a lot invested in your story up to a certain point, the new idea is probably not going to wreck what you have. It's going to enhance what you have and maybe send you toward a little different ending or a little different series of events that gets you to the ending that are going to be better. So we want to welcome those new ideas. And yes, indeed, the price you pay for changing lanes to a new idea is you've got to go back and make sure that that all is built on a foundation that is solid getting you to that point. But if it's a better idea, that's a good thing. We've just gotten a gift. And it's not a gift from the universe. It's a gift from your inner storyteller that your instincts kicking in and going, oh, here's something really cool I can do with what I just built. Just like the premise that we built, it was a monster getting these people. We thought it was a bear. Nah, it's little Mrs. You know, yes. fling on the side yeah. and they've got murder in their eyes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And what if a so, bear actually surfaces and gets that guy? Right. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. All right. It's so, a deus ex machina, so we don't want to have a bear coming out of the woods at the 11th hour and solving the whole problem. True. Unless you set it up and the people expect a bear to come. Exactly. All righty. So Rick Partlow is asking, how important is it for story arcs in series to stick to the same sort of beats and acts as individual novels? I think we've kind of touched on this. Yeah quite a bit um well i would say that if you have a three-part series you have three books each has four quartiles with four the same four generic contexts in each of them book two has to have a setup it needs a first plot point that you can't write until you understand what your dramatic arc is going to be the source of the dramatic tension what it asks the hero to do and survive and accomplish these are things that ultimately you have to land on if you're pantsing you have to land on them before your draft will work and you can't land on it at page 310. That's the pro That's the pit for a new pantser right there. Well, I didn't get my first plot point till page 300. I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And finally, around page 300, here it is. So I'm writing 80 more pages, the end. That story isn't going to work. Because if the writer knows that there's this roughly equal quartile context flow, and they know they've just written a 310-page part one, they know they're going to have to go in and revise that. The writer who doesn't know that may not know what they don't know, so they're going to submit that book, and they're going to get rejected, and they're not really going to understand why. Because guess what? Agents and publishers never give us the whole story. You get one line, and it goes like this. Well, I just never really related to the characters. Well, I kind of liked it. Your writing's good, but I just didn't feel it. That's all you'll get. Unless you're in a critique group or you have people that understand who will be really honest with you, that's all you're ever going to get from the professional side of the business. So it's up to us to know read. what principles we're using, what principles we're violating, or better, what principles we haven't encountered yet and need to understand and embrace and bring them into our quiver so that we can use the arrow there. So yeah, in a series, they all have the same basic contextual four-part arc that may look very different from book to book in terms of content, but the contextual flow should be the same. And I think that would help you to get unstuck if you're stuck plotting and you're asking yourself, oh, I'm in the middle of my plot, but I don't know what comes next or what should right. come next, is to go back to story structure and to think about um, what would naturally fit here and then how can your story um, work towards that. Right. Yeah, it's, you know, to use a bad analogy real fast, it's like you're, you're, you're in a private plane and you're alone. You know you have to land. 
So that isn't in question. You can't keep going. You're going to run out of gas. So the drama is, where am I going to land? How am I going to land? But I got to land. And what are all these buttons? <laughs> that's the principle that tells you, I got to land and I got to start landing right now. I can't wait four hours and then worry about landing because I'm going to run out of gas. The story is the same way. I like flying a metaphor. It's my favorite one. Kayleen, you're doing so good. Okay. <laughs> all right. Moving right along. Tyler Davis asks, if you were to move a beat, a fully fleshed out scene you'd originally intention to be earlier in the story into the second plot point, the shift into the third act, what kind of internal elements should you add or look for to ease that transition, given that you make whatever timeline adjustments that are needed? All right. This is a question of if the writer knows what they know or doesn't know what they don't know. Because if you... Remember what I said? There's four different contexts for a story. Every scene within every quartile aligns with its context. So every scene in the part one setup is setting up the story. Every scene in the second quartile is showing the hero responding to something. So you can't, if, you've, if you know that and you've done it right, you can't really move a scene as is from the first quartile to the fourth quartile because you're no longer setting up a story. The whole context is wrong. So if you want that thing to happen in the fourth quarter, it has to happen in alignment with the new context that the fourth quarter of the fourth quartile demands of you. And that is the story's not being set up, it's resolving. It's a whole different context. So really, it isn't like, well, should I show his father beating him in, in the first quartile or the fourth quartile? It depends on what, how that moment relates to the overall dramatic arc. Is it setting up the story or is it resolving the story? And you can't just arbitrarily move it from one to the other without having it align with the context of its new home, its new place within the four contextual part flow. Yeah. I guess you need to think about your character arc too, like where your yeah. character is, in their development or regression even yeah. as a character and how that fits with the, the overall conflict. Right. Well, there's a four-part character context too. Mm -hmm. It's uh, orphan, wanderer, warrior, uh, martyr. The same four contextual things. Orphan, they're not really in involved with the story that's going to happen to them yet because they don't know. Part two, they're wandering. Oh my gosh, I have to respond. I have to do something. Warrior, they're proactive in the third quartile. Martyr, they do what they have to do to save the day, achieve what they need to save, get done what they need to get done to resolve the story the way that you know, you don't have to have a happy ending. So it's the way you, the author, need to resolve it. But it has to be the hero striving for a virtuous outcome of some sort. Or if they're an anti-hero, an outcome that serves their personal greed or lust or whatever they're going for. All right. Um, William Tyler Davis says, I write cozies, but character arc. Exactly. <laughs> no, there's a character arc. Yes, there is. Yes, there they is. They start out and they have a whole in their hearts right yeah. you've got a hole in their life that the other one fills characters what makes the story cozy right, right. so yeah see and then and also all all your people watching listening you know that's understanding your genre you know we have these core principles that everything's built on and then we have this plethora of genres to choose from Absolutely. and mismatch but to mismatch you need to understand you know what makes a fantasy work that has dragons and magical powers while well, your you know magical power thing should make sense as far as that core you know but you're gonna inject a murder mystery you probably need to understand how a murder mystery kind of works and what those little tropes are and right. clues and whatnot um that's a great word and i'm glad you said it is that if you're gonna write in a genre understand the genre no don't don't rely on i don't know what i don't know you need to know about your genre and its tropes and its expectations and the way they're built they're still going to be built on the same four contextual flow i promise you but the setup in a fantasy novel looks way different than the setup in a love story because mm -hmm. in a fantasy novel it's way about world building and in a mm -hmm. love story it's way about character building so mm -hmm. they're both set up but they're different things driven by the genre all right, last question real quick. Lawrence Simpson asks, how do I know which subplots to keep? Well, subplots are, you, there's one thing you need to ask of your subplot, and that's that it contribute either to character 
arc and resolution or dramatic arc and resolution. If the subplot mm -hmm. doesn't contribute to either one of those, then it's an arbitrary sideline and you might look at why you want to tell this subplot. And I like to think of where you put a subplot with the visualization of a bridge and a bridge with three pillars in the water and then attached to both shores of a river. That's exactly like a story because what you have are four parts to the bridge. You have three foundations, first plot point, midpoint, second plot point. All the weight hangs on those three parts, but you can drape anything you want over the railing anywhere in that four part structure of the bridge because it's going to be fine because the core structure of the dramatic arc is, is in place for you. So really you wrap your, your subplot around your main story arc progression and you kind of have to make a judgment of where am I best served to uh, start this subplot, shift the subplot, evolve the subplot, and resolve the sub subplot. And you'll find it's going to align with the same four contextual descriptors. You're going to set it up. You're going to put your character into motion, but it's not going to go well. You're going to put the character into proactive mode. It's going to get better. And then it's going to resolve itself. And the subplot often comes forward and comes to the front of the stage and becomes a factor in the resolution of the whole story. So right. it's, it's great to have a great, powerful subplot to do that. But it can't come out of the blue. You have to set mm -hmm. it up. You have to let the reader relate to it. So when it does come back in as an important factor at the end, uh, it makes sense. Or surprises the crap out of you, one or the other. Yeah, it's got to be integrally connected with that main conflict. And it right. doesn't have to be in an obvious way, especially not at the start. But by the end, all those pieces have to come together. And right. your reader will thank you if you do that. And your editor will thank you if you cut out anything that does not have to do with that main story. Right. Uh, but I'm thinking of Dickens novels where he has all these separate plots that you, when you're first reading it, you don't know how they're connected at all. But by the end, they just come together in this magical way. And you're like, right. We're all connected. Oh, yeah. He's Dickens after all. So. <laughs> He's Dickens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he does that. Yeah. yeah. Darn have you ever noticed too that when in genre, when a book is character driven, it's the dramatic arc that's kind of the subplot. And when a book is dra dramatically driven, plot driven, it's the characterization that becomes a bit mm -hmm. of a subplot, like a love story mm -hmm. or a forgiveness story or a person doesn't know who they are subplot while they're dealing with the dramatic task you've asked them to encounter and resolve or the other way around. Mm -hmm. The best way to do character arc is put your characters in perilous, demanding, high pressure situations. Then you see who your characters are. Yeah, turn up the heat. Exactly, turn up the heat. Put them in a tree and you light it on fire. There you go, watch <laughs> them jump. <laughs> Over a cliff. Yeah. Onto rocks. Yes, oh, gosh, there she goes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you write. No, that's right, that's right. All right. So, oh my God, we could probably go for like another five hours. I you bet know? we could, I bet um, we could. But eventually, it's late for you guys. That's, you know, you, where you are. Worth it. Worth it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm learning. You bet. I learn uh, something every time I talk about this, every time I talk to a writer, there's a little twist on a perspective. There's a little twist on a principle or the nuance. For me, the principles get, the harder the question, the more the principles get reinforced as the, the instructive, leading, clarifying element to any story mm -hmm. problem you're going to have. And when I say principles, I'm not just talking structure. There's principles on how to build a scene. There's build principles on how to introduce characters. There's principles on all this stuff that happens across the structure. And at the end of the day, they serve each other. You know, one, one of the ways my words, you know, is what's your skeleton look like? Exactly. Is, it, is, it a, is it a strong skeleton or are you missing some ribs? Do you have all the femurs, you know? Right. You know, you could probably be missing some, you know, a few finger, few fingertips and an ear here and there, but. Right. Um, <laughs> and I think it's good to remember that as you listen to other people talk about this, have an ear for what they're really talking about. Are they talking about process or are they talking about product and principles? So, for example, one of my colleagues has a book out called Story Trump's Structure. And at a glance, you go, well. Everything I've just heard goes away because story trumps structure. We don't need to care about structure. Yet when you read his book, he's telling you about this exact same structure. Mm. He's talking about process. He's talking about finding your narrative 
arc through story revelation, which happens to coincide with how the structure, the four contexts, tell you what you sh the story should be doing right there. So it's really the same thing. Stephen King claims, you know, I'm a pantser, I'm a pantser. He's pantsing this structural model every time. Because it's how stories are built. It isn't like, well, I, I don't want to admit it, but I'm doing Larry's structure. First of all, it isn't Larry's structure. It's physics. It's just, it's a natural law. It's always been there. And one other people talk about it. To. Yeah. So whether you pants or whether you plot, that's your choice. That's your choice that you hold on to and you can make it work for you. The more you know, the less the gap is between not knowing what you don't know. Mm. And that's the point of this whole thing. You want to really shrink the gap so that there's very little left that you haven't thought about or encountered or understand as the conventional wisdom best practices truth about how a novel's built. And then apply that to your process however you want to do it. Naked hanging upside down from a tree, go for it. Whatever your process is, that's fine. But you'll notice keynote addresses and a lot of instructors, especially if they're a famous novelist, they'll stand up there and sell you their process and lead you to believe that that's the way it should be done. And the answer is that's the way it should be done for them. You decide if it's for you because the principles that are going to make it work or not are the same for both of you. It's the principles that are going to set you free. It's what you know as much as what you feel. And when you have a high degree of both of those things, you know a lot and you feel a lot, mm. go for it because you're going to have a big career. All right. You heard it here. Understand the principles and you could build any race you want. You could build any world you want. You could put your characters on the moon. You could put them in a new galaxy. Well put. You could, you could do all the things all the time, every day, all the words. Know your core, your skeleton, your principles, whatever word you want to put on it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm referring, you know, building a house. You have foundation. That's what we're talking about right now. What's the foundation to build that gorgeousness that you live in? Um, so thank you for coming on. We're, I mean, at this wow. point, I mean, we still have 12 people watching us. So, I mean, they're definitely <laughs> hanging for on in there. 12, yeah. the dirty dozen we're with you. Um, so can you remind our, Oh, okay. Sticker. She's flashing yeah. a sticker at me. Who wins a sticker? Let's subjectively pick J.R. Hanley. <laughs> Woo! Who's running away to go help us kid. <laughs> But JR, yeah, message me, I'll send you a sticker. Congratulations, JR. You are the winner of a brand new Keystroke Medium sticker. You can stick it anywhere on your phone, on stick your car, <laughs> on the back of your shirt. Be sure shirt. you stick it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you, Larry, can you remind our viewers, listeners, where they can find you and your work if they want to internet sure. stalk you gently? Yeah, Not I have a website, uh, Story Fix, one word, storyfix.com. I just put up a guest post from another novelist today, so you might want her work out. She has a beautiful take on uh, the bloodletting and the and angst of what it what it takes from us. So it's nice to know we're not alone. And uh, I have over a thousand posts on the site on anything you can think of about doing this work. A lot of it about these principles. And you can t contact me through the site, and I'm happy to chat with you and try to answer. I certainly don't know everything. So if I've ever sounded in any point in this thing that I sound like I think I know everything, I don't. So I just want to get you thinking about principles as my foundational purpose here. And I can point you towards some principles that maybe have helped you if you need it. All right. Wonderfully said. Thank you all for listening, viewing, hanging out with us, hitting that subscribe button, smashing that like button, and leaving us all of the comments and dinging the bell. You got to do all ding. of them so that you ding know the when you got to ding the bell. I don't know how to do that, but I'd be dinging if I had a bell here. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks, you so, two, for having me and everybody for listening. I appreciate it. Yes, we appreciate you. Um, I really need to finish that book because it's just all the juices, all the flowing, all the goodness. It's fantastic. Hey, All leave work. a review when you're done. I'd appreciate that. Amazon's, and... uh, have you ever noticed that the reviews are getting harder and harder to come by, even for established writers and stuff? It's it's really oh, yeah. changing. Yeah. So it is. use the help. All righty. 
Y'all heard it here. We're going to be back next week. Talk about more reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Good night, guys.